president of the Kingston Historical Society. And the society is really very happy to work with Kingston Presbyterian Church and having a community celebration. 300th anniversary. It's an absolutely enormous achievement for any institution. Uh, and the Kingston Presbyterian Church has been the premier first institution in this community. And we all are very grateful, not only uh, members of the church, but uh, everyone else in the community, too. It, it has played a major role in the community from its birth. I'd like to just welcome everybody and we will then start with presentation. Established. 
So the Dutch came, and the Scotch came, the Scots came, and the English. And they made a life here. And George and I keep having this conversation. Because in the earliest writings, it says there was a log cabin where people gathered together to worship. And it was alongside the Millstone River. Well, if you've walked through the cemetery, that's alongside the Millstone River. So our question was, was it on the river or near the river? We don't know. And so we keep having this conversation, was it three buildings, was it four buildings, that this congregation in some fashion has called home? We don't know. We'd love to hear what you think. We know there were at least three buildings. A log cabin, what we knew first in the cemetery that we walked through, what we call the cemetery, which was then at just some point church grounds, bought from Jedediah Higgins, who came to this area in the 1700s. He bought a thousand, thousand acres of land. And somewhere before his death in 1715, he sold a part of that to the church community, which means even though we are chartered in 1723, there was a community of people who called this place home, gathered with friends to pray before, because he sold them land to hold their church. And as was the tradition, the graves grew up around it. So we think of it about it as the cemetery. They thought about it as their church home. And if you go to any of the churches in the region, very often you find a church, what? Surrounded by gravestones, right? People want to come to church any way they can. What we know is that the village grew. The charter originally says, January 21st, 1723, to all the Christian people to whom these presents shall come and set forth the trust in the church, Kingston Presbyterian Church is for the inhabitants of that said township of Kingston and their successors, inhabiting and dwelling within the said township forever. We're not a township anymore, but we're still here. For the public and the common use and the benefit of the whole township. The faithful grew, they gathered, they took the charter, and they let that inform who they would be. Reverend Wales was the first recorded pastor of the Presbyterian Church. I wonder if you drive through the counties that we call home and think, why are there so many Presbyterian churches? Because we are in what we call the bed of Presbyterianism outside of Scotland. If you want me to bore you, feel free to ask questions about that any day of the week. I know way too much. This church was not only key in this community, but in the communities of Dutch Neck and Cranberry and Princeton. In the region, we created and helped with the university, with the seminary, and with the presbytery, which is what we call our governing area. This church has been a part of this life in this region and in this area and has loved being a part of that. And for that, we're thankful. George, he's going to tag in for the next component. So why Kingston and why here? <clears throat> this area grew because it is the midpoint between New York City and Philadelphia. And as Pastor Charles already indicated, this was the trail that the Lenape Indians used to get back and forth, especially to the Delaware River for fishing. And so the colonists expanded the road and made it bigger. In fact, John Adams is quoted as saying it is the finest road he ever trod. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that today. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the important place. So Kingston, by 1770s, consisted of a sawmill, a grist mill, a blacksmith shop, several taverns and inns, uh, and about 20 homes, plus a church and a school. We don't know if the school was attached at all to the church. 
But in early America, a lot of the times, churches did sponsor schools. Uh, but we just don't have enough facts to know that. So that's what this village looks like. And as we move forward, American history tells us that there was tension between the colonists and Great Britain in the 1770s. And when this church celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1773 with Reverend Jacob Van Arsdale, these tensions were great. By the time of 1775, Reverend Van Arsdale has moved on, and there is no pastor here. But we now have a war for independence. And the church sitting on top of that hill sees troop movements back and forth from both the British and the colonists, the Continental Army, on several occasions. In fact, New Jersey is the crossroads of the revolution, and I will tell you, Kingston is the crossroads of the crossroads, because we had many times east and west and north and south travel. In fact, we don't know what happened to this church in the cemetery at that time. We do know that King George called the War for Independence that damned Presbyterian Rebellion. <laughs> so he kind of blamed the Presbyterians for causing the uproar. We know that it's not necessarily completely true. <laughs> but we do know that the British troops from history tell us that they abused the Presbyterian churches in a great deal of time. They normally would not destroy the building because the building was useful. They would turn the building into a riding stable or a stable for their horses. They would destroy the Bibles and the hymnals, um, using them for whatever, campfires or wadding for the muskies. Uh, but Presbyterian churches weren't treated very well. Again, we do not know what happened to our church, but we can assume that it suffered the same fate. We do know that after the first battle of Trenton, there were troops quartered here in Kingston. There was a troop of light force. Uh, they, they, the British would quarter different troops in different villages along the way. So Maidenhead, Princeton, Kingston, uh, Brunswick, or New Brunswick as we call it today, all would have troop stations. So there's only 20 homes and a couple of taverns, so there's not a lot of room for soldiers. So they probably used the uh, church either to keep soldiers in or it was used as a stable. Um, things happened. Uh, January 3rd, the uh, Battle of Princeton is fought. So after that Battle of Princeton, General Washington moves his troops out of Princeton and comes to Kingston. And the day of the battle, it is said that the residents of Kingston can hear the cannonading going on in Princeton from that battle. And I can believe it because I heard fireworks the other night. So <laughs> I'm sure they heard noise. And uh, he meets with his generals on car, on a conference, on horseback. They say in the cemetery, I will tell you it's in front of the church. History writers, after the fact that there's no church there, they kind of just say, well, it was in the cemetery. But there was a building there. And so he meets on horseback with his other generals, and the decision, which is critical in the revolution, is what to do. The original plan was for Washington and his troops to march to Brunswick, which is where the British had their treasury, their stores, all their equipment. And if Washington had been successful, possibly the war would have ended. However, as they talk in the cemetery, they realize that the troops have been up for 72 hours. They're ill-fed, they're ill-clothed, they've been under arms the whole time. They had fought the second battle of Trenton. They had marched overnight, trying to come out to go to Lord Brunswick, only to be find the rear guard of the British Army leaving Princeton to go end the war in Trenton. And uh, they have another battle, which they win and move on to Kingston. So they're just too tired. They decide to head up the uh, river and go on into winter quarters for uh, that, that winter of 1777. Uh, after that, the war ends, and in 1791,
the church and the cemetery burns. We don't know what caused it, but the fire probably somebody didn't stoke the stove properly or whatever. Church burns down. Within a year, a new church is erected on that site uh, in 1792. That church is a wood frame building. It has large windows, much like you see here in this church. It has balconies on three sides. One of the balconies is reserved for the black folks, both slave and, uh, and not slave, free blacks, were relegated to the one bathroom. It also had large pews on each side with a center aisle and um, a sounding board over the pulpit so that because they didn't have the benefit of the speaker system, uh, so that the pastor could be heard. When John, uh, when Stephen Van Voorhees is called to be the pastor, in 1792, well, actually he's called in 1791, but he doesn't accept it in 1793. Mm -hmm. There is a shared responsibility with him. He does also preach in Sandpaper. And for those of you that are not familiar with Sandpaper, it's what is now Dutch Net. And we have that shared agreement until he takes over here uh, full time. Preaching at his installation service is the Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon, and giving the charge is the Reverend Dr. Stanhope Smith, both associated with the College of New Jersey. And don't get confused. The College of New Jersey is what we now know as Princeton University. Uh, but they were here, and in fact, when the church was without pastors, the two of them had preached in the church then. Is located where the current cemetery is. Um, and during the, this time frame, the church actually acts as judge and jury for different uh, cases. So if you have a disagreement with your neighbor, you come to the church, and we have these recorded in the minutes of the session that tells us about these different uh, cases, and you would come, first you would have to submit to the ruling and agree to do that, and uh, you would plead your case in front of the session or the elders of the church, and then they would make a decision, and then the pastor would pass judgment, and that's what you would live with. Um, and so the church had a role in the community other than preaching the gospel on Sunday. In 1800, Reverend Cummings was elected pastor of the church's pastor and will serve for 50 years. That's our longest pastor. Um, we don't have a picture of him, but we do have a nice drawing. And we don't have pictures of all the pastors, but we have pictures of some, and a drawing of uh, comfort. In 1848, this church will send the first missionary, a woman, to China, a daughter of this church and a daughter of this village. She is Elizabeth, Van Dyke, and she marries a seminarian who comes to work alongside her father as a, for her father's an elder. She comes to work, she falls in love with a seminarian. This church has had long relationships with the seminary, and off to China they go. The women of the church took incredible pride and great interest in this, and they sent barrels. We send barrels now to Haiti. They were sending barrels in the 1840s, 1850s to China. In 1850, Reverend Comfort resigns because of his health, but continues to live in the church. His work alongside the College of New Jersey and the seminary and the presbytery are appreciated and praised. Having served as a trustee at the university, what we will know as the university, and establishing the seminary. In 1851, the manse was built, with a parsonage, which are none of the buildings that we know in this space. It's actually number 4513 up north. Just a couple of houses up from your house, Eric. Actually, right next door to you, Eric. If you drive north, you'll see it. It was purchased from Alexander Bayless and later was owned by the Schuler family. It was the Gulf Inn. 
not an end to staying, but an end to have picnics in the grove. Maybe you remember the dance pavilion or the tavern. In 1850, December of 1851, that same year, the church thought, let's move out of what we know as the cemetery. And they purchased this land. And you might look at the cemetery land, but I hope you looked at some of the, um, the maps downstairs. And if you didn't do it today, come back on the 24th for the Blueberry Festival and, and look at them then. You'll see that the cemetery land is purchased and it keeps getting bigger. At the time the church bought this land, this was a bigger parcel. And so the church in 1851 decided to build the manse down the block and then to build this building. 1852, the church moves down the street, moves out of the cemetery and comes and starts worshiping in what you are in now. The same year, so the church is built for $6,000. Can you even imagine? <laughs> 300 shares of $20 each. The elders who were part of that building committee you might know some of these names. Elijah Stout, Peter Gulick, John Curser. In 1856, Elijah Stout is, was paid $155 by the church to put up a fence that you probably drew, drove through to come in tonight to keep the cows out. In 1856, the church paid him, oh no, he paid the church a dollar and thirty-seven to keep his sheep in the cemetery. <laughs> Kingston's leadership and pastors were supportive and active in the leadership, not only here, but like I said, at Dutch Neck and Cranberry and Princeton, Maidenhead, what we know as Lawrenceville, and Kingston shared the pastorate and helped the people of Princeton until they asked for a pastor in 1755. Until then, the pastors of Kingston and Maidenhead would take turns and ride their horse into the center of Princeton and just preach for whoever showed up. And they would trade off as it went. In 1959, the bell and what we love as the steeple are at. We think about this church as being not only this building, but the steeple. I don't know about you, but when I'm driving home from who knows where, I look for the steeple. It tells me I'm almost there. As I'm sitting with all of my friends in the queues coming from who knows where, I look for the steeple. That doesn't come to be a part of this building, a part of the iconic Kingston landscape until 1859. So we get to the 1860s. And after many years of compromise and tensions and disagreements, this country erupts in a civil war over slavery. Many of the young people of this church volunteer to go and serve. One such person was Peter Shan. And we know Peter sent letters back to his father. And in the letters, he's lamenting that he didn't pay enough attention to the sermons when he was home. Because the chaplain for their regiment was just terrible. Uh, Peter gets wounded at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and that ends his military career. He is shipped back to Kingston. But he comes, he's active in the church. And I, I started thinking about this that these young men that went off to war had worshipped in that church in the cemetery. That's where they start. That was their first indoctrination into the church. They also saw this one built. In fact, Peter Shan lived right across the street. So he would have seen this whole church built and the steeple added and all before he heads off to war. And I can imagine when he got back to Kingston how relieved he was to see that this church was still here as a beacon for his home. Peter ends up uh, an elder. He ends up also being the treasurer of the church Sunday school. Uh, and it, it's interesting to know that in those days, the Sunday school, whatever they took in, had their own treasury. So the church had a treasury, and the Sunday school had a treasury, and there were many years 
that this church with financial difficulties would borrow from the Sunday school in order to meet its budget. One thing that is possibly unique about this church is they always paid it back with interest. So whenever they borrowed from a fund or from another part of the, the church, they paid it back. Uh, the Sabbath school, or today as we refer to it as the Sunday school, was in the basement. And it was cordoned off with uh, curtains so that different classes could meet. Um, and uh, it was begun in 1868. So the Sunday school, as we know it, or the Sabbath school was begun in 1868. And sometime in the 1800s, also the Christian Endeavor Society, you may have seen some information on that in the uh, basement, but became a very important part of this church. And they would do many fundraisings throughout the years to help with budget issues also. The last half of the 19th century, finances were constantly an issue. So crops were raised on both the church property and on the parsonage, the manse, down the street. And those crops were sold so that the church could make money to meet its budget. And they also had apple trees. So the apples were harvested and people would go out and sell apples to the community, again, to make money. There were also sheds behind this church. And those sheds were owned by the church, built by the church, and then they would either rent or sell to members of the community. A lot of church members would rent the shed so that they would have a place to tie the horse up when they came on Sunday for worship. So they would have a shed out back and they paid rent to the church for that. Um, 1856 I found fascinating was that they finally developed some rules regarding the cemetery and session passes this, that the sexton shall demand one dollar from every person who does not contribute to the yearly support of the gospel before they have the privilege of burying the corpse. So if you weren't attending church, you had to pay a dollar to be able to bury someone. <laughs> Those rules changed a little bit in 1864 when they stated that all strangers must pay $10 before ground is to be broken. And no person may stake out a grave without the permission of the trustees. So apparently there were people dying and people just went and decided this is where we're going to bury them and started staking it out and digging and the, and the church says we can't do that anymore. Um, so those were, were interesting rules that, that I had never heard of. By 1862, there's a singing school that's established in the church. 1866, an organ replaces the melodeon. Melodeon is a small reed organ type instrument which had been in use since 1852 when the church moved here. In fact, Isaac Chandler Whittington, another name that is probably familiar to a lot of people in Kingston because he owned an awful lot of property. Uh, is appointed a committee of one to make the exchange. I don't think that works for that. <laughs> but the new organ though requires pumping. So in order to play music, somebody has to pump the air. This was performed by the young boys of the community whose parents were a godly bunch who worshipped each Sunday. So they got the privilege of working it and pumping the organ. Um, eventually the church would pay for people to pump the organ. In fact, Peter Shan, who I mentioned earlier, uh, paid for his pew rent of $6 a year by pumping the organ. The other interesting thing about Peter Shan, which I will mention, is when he died, he was buried in the cemetery. But his grave is within the walls of the original church. So I thought that was kind of interesting. That that's where his final resting place is. So pew rents help pay for the budget. And uh, it's, the church would have numbers on the side of the pews. When you purchased whatever or rented whatever pew number. And they had doors. So nobody else could go in. That was your pew. And that's where you stayed. I wonder if the pews in the front were 
more expensive or less expensive? <laughs> <laughs> Today it seems like everybody starts sitting in the back and moving forward. So. I'm going to do some exploring on that. This is just be an interesting thing to find out. Um, so, 1867, a lady sewing society is formed, and their main purpose is to care for man's. But they also would uh, make underwear for the seminarian students. Um, it's been a long, complicated relationship. 1870, they have, uh, again, trouble with the stove. I don't think it's stove. But they're not cooking. It's not a cooking stove. It's more like a Ben Franklin stove that heats the, the church. And they were having problems with it. And so, as Presbyterians do, they gave it to a committee. Um, and the committee talks about it back and forth, and session deals with it. And then finally, by October of 1867, 1876, so we're talking six years uh, with problems, uh, Chili Weather finally got to the congregation, and they requested it to be fixed or replaced. And so it is. Uh, the Loyal Ladies have a committee in 1873 that helps the trustees with funds to improve the cemetery. And in 1874, the sexton was given the responsibility of cutting the cemetery grass twice a year, June and August or September. So many residents take it on their own and they take hand clippers and push mowers, and we're not talking push mowers, they're not gas driven, they're <laughs> push mowers down to the cemetery and they maintain their own plots. Uh, and this goes on for many years. In 1878, another church is organized in Kingston, which is the United Methodist Church. And that same year, Reverend John Schofield uh, gives back 25% of his salary to the church because of financial difficulty. So he gave back, he made $800 a year. So he gives back $200 of that to the church to help with the financial issues. 1881, June, they have the first strawberry festival here. And that same fall, in September, the church hosts a harvest fall. And that was like a carnival, but they provided lunch and supper, and uh, they had tents, and they sold uh, all kinds of goods, baked goods, uh, embroidery, embroidered and um, crocheted items. There was a band playing music all day. There was ice cream and soda available, and the Christian Endeavor Society sold candy. And the proceeds from both these events went to serve the church budget. And those kind of things are how they maintain the budget of the church. In 1886, Laura Withington provides stained glass windows for this church. Um, I guess we'll get into that a little later, but they, there were stained glass windows in this church. In 1891, the fire destroys the home of Charles B. Moore. Charles B. Moore was the treasurer of this church. Uh, he was a businessman. He eventually becomes a state senator, number one, so Andrew, you're number two, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, he becomes, uh, all our church records, our early church records, are lost. And so when we put some of these things together, it's extremely difficult in doing some of the research. And in 1893, there's a repair fund established. The church was repainted. The doors were removed from the pews. And uh, carpets and cushions were purchased. So prior to that, we would have been sitting on just playing boards. Now it's a little more complicated. <laughs> and that brings us up to 1900. Reverend Whiteside is the pastor, and he works with the village to bring electricity to the streets, which seems wild. That's not that long ago, friends. Electricity comes. He's also, he rides his bike everywhere, and there are schools out um, along the Ridge Road, there is school 24, and we'll celebrate in, I hope, big ways next year, the firehouse. And the fire company comes to Kingston. After the devastating fire that claims not only the Potts House, the house that's next door, well, this is the new Potts House, 
but also the dry goods, and then a third house. It didn't take all the way down to Laurel, but enough that if you look at this house, it has enough room between both sides. Mr. Potts didn't want to lose a house again. And that's why that big, sorry, that big driveway space is there, right? And why we needed a firehouse. And aren't we thankful for the fire company of Kingston? The pastors of this church throughout the centuries have been a part of the community, have participated in the life of the fire company in any way they could. They've participated in calling for electricity, for helping be a judge and jury if need be. They also rang the bell, the fire bell was in the steeple. And so we wonder, George and I have talked about this, who rang the bell? Was it the pastor or was it someone else who lived nearby? We don't know. But we love the idea that the bell was in the steeple and it would be rung and the company would gather and take care of their neighbors. The first and second wars would come and Kingston men would go to serve and the pastors of this church wrote them letters, encouraged their spirits, and cared for their families when there were losses and devastating letters. With World War II ending, and I hope you did get a chance to look at the service flag down there because this congregation sent 41 members to serve in the armed forces during World War II. Uh, the baby boomer generation has begun, and the church attendance is growing. In 1951, Mrs. Luella Conover, who was a Sunday school teacher and our organist for approximately 13 years, requests permission for her class to conduct a daily vacation Bible school in the summer. And they invite the members of the Methodist Church to also participate. In that same year, Richard Stoltz, a member of this church, becomes the first son to request to go to seminary. Uh, his family was back to the 1800s in this church. In fact, he is related to the Shan family. As members of the church, he has session to recommend him to the New Brunswick Presbytery, which they do, and he becomes a candidate for ministry and becomes the first son of this church to be ordained in 1956. In 1955, the growth of the church and Sunday school showed the need for increased capacity. And so, with the dedication of Mr. Harold Freeman and Donald Wolf, both elders of this church, the project was completed. Mr. George Howe, who was a gentleman farmer that lived down the street and uh, actually made his money as a finance expert in New York, uh, but had a farm here, contributed a great deal to make sure that this endeavor was uh, successful. The project consi uh, consisted of a pastor study, a ladies' parlor, a secretary's office, a youth room, and six Sunday school classes to take care of the burgeoning number of children coming. In that same year, the youth groups changed from uh, two senior Westminster from the Christian Endeavor Society. This, I can tell you by looking at minutes, was not an easy decision. And there were a lot of people that weren't happy with the final decision, but that's when that happened. Um, 56, the church combined the positions of elders and trustee into one job. Prior to that, we had elders who were make up the session and make the decisions in the church, and trustees who may or may not be members of the church, but were leaders in the community that made decisions based on the uh, business side of the, the church. In, in 56, uh, that changes and they become one position. 57, the church purchases a bus. Um, I kind of remember this because my father was one of the deacons that drove it. Kendall Park has been built north of the, the village. A lot of new homes from, from this baby boomer generation as they moved out into the suburbs. And what they did was run a bus up into the Kendall Park area and surrounding communities and bring both adults and children to church and Sunday school. In 59, um, 
another bus was bought because the bus from 57 was kind of failing. But they ended up using both buses that summer for vacation Bible school. And they had 216 children attend vacation Bible school for two weeks in the daytime. And 119 of them had perfect attendance. So in 1961, uh, they decided to sell both buses and buy a more modern bus, a 1957 bus that was only four years old. However, things were changing. There was a new church starting in Kendall Park, the Community Presbyterian Church of the Sand Hills, and they complained to Presbytery that this church was stealing their members, or <laughs> potential members. And so we went to the Presbytery and the Reverend Clarence Strixie gave an elephant defense of us and our bus, but the Presbytery didn't agree, and so that stopped the bus route. <laughs> a complete renovation of the sanctuary occurred in 1958. The choir was moved from behind the pulpit, and there was only one pulpit at the time, and now we have a pulpit and a lectern. And they were put over onto the right corner along with the organ. However, the choir was not uh, asked about this, and unfortunately, their pews faced the pastor in the wall. They didn't like the singing to the wall. And so they made a complaint the session, and the pews, as you can see, were turned so that when they sing their anthems, they are facing the congregation. Uh, but along with that, they also uh, had a renovations including the cry room, the balcony upstairs, so that all these young families that were coming um, and were afraid their children would be disrupted in the service could go upstairs and sit and worship as a family and enjoy the whole service without the kids crying too much uh, and bothering others. So that's, that was done and that was under the able leadership of Elder George E. D. Carlin. As the pastor already said, the church has always been involved in the community. So there was a Boy Scout troop that was sponsored, Troop 84, from uh, this church. And that was in 1965 that was organized and existing for the mid-80s. And also uh, Girl Scout troops met here and 4-H Club. Uh, 1972, the, the session saw a need for new cemetery rules. Uh, and they basically decided to make it restricted as far as burials because the space was running out. There's only so much space in the cemetery. And so now it's required that you are either a member of this church, a member of the Methodist church, or a member or a resident of the village of Kingston. Now what is the village of Kingston? So that's kind of discretionary. But I will use this as a PSA. Anybody's interested? You can see me. <laughs> for our 250th anniversary in 73, the church is designated as a historical site number 26 by the American Presbyterian Reform Historical Sites Registry of the Presbyterian Historical Society. So this is now a registered historical site. Uh, in 1974, saw the arrival of Reverend John Heinsohn, Jr. And in 1979, under his leadership, the church starts going to work camps. The first one is in North Dakota, and then subsequent ones have been to Guatemala, Honduras, Maine. And currently, we do uh, work camps to Haiti because a daughter of this church, Dr. Katie Wolf, runs a medical clinic in Jeremy Haiti. Her Walmart bells were purchased in 1980 and dedicated uh, in memory of uh, Luella Conover and uh, let's see, capital repair funds. So you can see we've had financial issues and we've had lots of funds to try to raise money to repair things. Um, the main thing in, in 82 was established to do a major rehabilitation of the steeple and the manse. The steeple, as I said earlier, has been a problem. The ladies had helped with the leaks in the spire. 
back in the 1870s, and every <laughs> every five years or so, it seems there are problems with the steeple. If you look at the book downstairs, you can see some of the rock and problems that that steeple endured. And so a committee was established to look at the rehabilitation of that steeple. And uh, again, the sanctuary is refurbished in 81, including a fire alarm detection system and uh, air conditioning, pew cushions, uh, and all the Hispanic Fellowship under Elder Maria Lee was started here uh, for the Hispanics of the area. And then and it was decided in 1989 that another major renovation had to occur um, and was needed. So in, in 1989, Project 89 was launched. A lift is added in the back, which some of you may have used to get up here. So the church became handicapped accessible. We switched from oil to gas heat. Uh, a new electrical system was put in, the assembly room was expanded, a new kitchen was added, and on the second floor, a larger secretary's office and a large work room were added. As part of this project, 10 mission projects were also added to this, uh, and under the encouragement of Elder Gene Gibson, uh, Citizens for Independent Living in South Brunswick uh, was designated as one of those groups that we worked with. This, uh, group, uh, you know, helps developing disabled young adults. In the same year, in 89, a new group is formed in case and known as the Case and Initiative to help bridge the gap between Franklin and South Brunswick Townships and to get the voices of the people in the village of Case and Heard. The Reverend John Heinsohn does serve on that committee, again, showing that the, the pastors have constantly tried to be involved in the community because this church is community based and, and we see ourselves as that. Uh, and so they played a larger role in this, uh, designating, making items that affect the town, such as open space, traffic control, preserving the history, and uh, small town atmosphere. So those were important things. People continue to get more expensive to maintain. So a CEPA task force was started in 1997 to explore different options, including the possibility of removing it and just not having the steeple, uh, which would have been, in my opinion, devastating. Uh, the church celebrated its 275th anniversary in 1998 with a colonial worship service, a pig roast, and historic walk. And in 1999, the church participates in the 75th anniversary of the fire company and the 325th of the village of Kingston by having a float. The float depicted a covered wagon, and Reverend Heinsohn was holding the reins for the horse. Well, not the horse, of course, this was a tractor. But <laughs> in any case, uh, many members of the church participated in that parade. And after the parade, the church had a chicken barbecue dinner on the church lawn, which hosted 300 people. That brings us up there. 2000. So many years, but I'm going to be quick at the last 23. Mm -hmm. This church has hosted the Toastmasters and yoga groups and the Princeton Reporters and AA groups and Al Anon groups and the Korean School. And too many recitals to even count. We've also shared our building with other congregations. Two, Sunday afternoon at 2, you're welcome to Korean worship that is beautiful and thoughtful. Latina, um, Latino communities and the Taiwanese Fellowship, a Japanese congregation, have all called this place home. In 2010, John Heinsohn and Shirley retire from their ministry in this church after serving for 36 years. Came close to comfort. In 2011, the congregation takes over John's garden because we all know John is a pastor but also a farmer, right? And so 
The congregation takes his garden, it continues to tend it, and gives the food to the food bank and to Princeton's arm in arm ministry. Is it 13 that Grief Share comes to Kingston? 12. Was 12? 12 to Texas Okay. I knew it was in there. 13 and 12. Kingston begins the ministry of Grief Share, which I'm sure you walk by or drive by the sign all the time and think, oh, is that just for church members? And I can tell you, church members have used the congregational group, but it's a group for anyone who's lost someone that they love and needs someone to journey with them. And so people come from within the village and all over. In 2013, December, this congregation calls me as their next pastor and as the first woman. In 2014, we invite the community and the village to watch the steeple come down. <laughs> And some of you came, and we drank cider, and we watched it, and we thought, oh my goodness. And then it was just covered in tarps. <laughs> and do you remember that long winter? And in the spring, we invited the community again to come and watch the steeple rise. And it did. And some of you wrote your names in the steeple before it went up. And we're thankful for that. And now, because it is not wood, like the one pillar downstairs that is incredibly well made, we will not have to keep repairing it, thanks be to God. In 2020, in a year when we all did things that we never thought we would do, this church decided to start, I don't know, going online. And some of you peeked in and you would message me and say, oh, I liked what you thought about that. And then others of you messaged me and said, I don't agree. And I loved all of it. We also decided that we needed a box in the front of the church for our community friends and our neighbors who need a blessing. And so some of you have put things in the blessing box and others of you may have taken things. And we're thankful for that as well. We continue to believe we are a part of care and absolutely a part of this community. We celebrate 300 years and really more of being a part of what this village is and who we can be. And we are thankful to be your neighbor and we are thankful to be a part of this village life. So thank you for coming tonight and thank you for listening to our story. But it's not just our story, it's our story. I'm afraid to even ask, but do you have any questions? <laughs> by Keats. So I kind of wonder, is it a part of someone's basement? Right? Could it be a part of your porch? Could it be a part of who knows what? But I love to think that it was a blessing to whoever purchased different pieces. It wasn't sold as a whole building. We know it went by Keats. And what pieces did the church think, well, nobody wants those, and what did they do with them? We don't know, but we love the, we love the curiosity of it. What about the stained glass? Oh, uh, I didn't talk about the stained glass because I wanted to keep going. Um, <laughs> and because you can imagine it was controversial. The stained glass, in the Reformed tradition, which the Presbyterian Church is a part of, we love to worship God. We don't like to worship people or things. And so in most of the Reformed churches that you're going to go into, they're going to look like this. They're going to be simple. They're going to have no stained glass. They're going to have less um, uh, pizzazz. 
right? So it takes a lot to, to take care of stained glass, and so they were taken out, and people left, and they were mad. And they went to Miller Memorial, which had beautiful stained glass windows. And at some point in the last 10 years, I was having coffee at a church. Oh, it was a it was an interfaith South Brunswick clergy interfaith association, because we've got to get a smaller name, Thanksgiving meal. Like, you know, we had our Thanksgiving service and then we were all kind of chatting and eating and we were at the mosque and Someone said to me, oh, I used to be a member of your church, but then you took out the stained glass windows. <laughs> and he said, but you're nice. And I said, well, you're welcome anytime, but I don't have stained glass windows. And so they were taken out partially because of the repair in those pieces, but also because the congregation felt like the theology should be simpler and purer and, and more focused on and so these are what we're put in. So you can see in some of these windows, and we did actually repairs and some um, conservation work this summer, um, some of the panels had to be taken out and changed because they were aging. But you can see there are a couple that are kind of uh, a little not as clear as you might think, and that's because they're from the earlier pieces. Glass is molten. Pardon me? Glass is molten. Glass is molten. It's here. Yeah. And if you look at some of the church history in those books, you'll see a couple of pictures of the sanctuary with, with stained, stained glass. glass windows. Yeah. And so you like to think that Congress, the, the people of Kingston had a choice. You can come and have clean, clear windows, or you can have beautiful stained glass and go to the Methodists. It, it, our village has choices, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Great. Oh, oh yes. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a Presbyterian, but I feel like one. My son was a Presbyterian. My brother in law graduated from seminary. And I'm a history major who's now reading up on John Lewis. And I'm a Princeton graduate also contemplating the current controversy about the statue mm -hmm. of Lewis. So this prompts three questions in one. Oh, my conversation. I do have some other information on Witherspoon because I betrayed him a couple of times. So what I'm going to say is that I would love to have a long conversation with you, but I think that's a, I think that's a topic that maybe you and I would love to hear about. Everybody else is thinking, is there time for dessert? What else is going on? So is that a conversation we can have? And if anybody else wants to drop in on it, I'd love to do that. But that's a big question. Um, a big question. Linda, I'll talk to you as well. I, but I think the Witherspoon pieces, you, you picked that up. I just want yeah, to be mindful of people's times. The, the, the church did have, a, uh, you know, in the back room, one was reserved for blacks, and that was both enslaved and free. In the early 1700s, mid 1700s, up until, well, New Jersey doesn't ban slavery until 1804. Right. All right? So there are slaves in this state until then, and even after that, because it was not. You know, January 1st, 1804, all slaves are free. If you were a slave, you continue to slave. All right? So it was, you know, a gradual ending of slavery. So the church, I don't know that it took it. It was the way of life. In fact, Witherspoon owned two slaves. And the two slaves he owned, he said that was from the law of Moses. And if you read into the theology, if you were born a slave, you were asleep. And, and so he had that, but Witherspoon also taught blacks uh, at Princeton, 
and he would tutor black folks. So uh, he's kind of an enigma. Did he have slavery? Yes. But he also worked with blacks to teach them and give them an education. And I think sometimes we in the 2023 get caught up too much in thinking this is all bad and slavery is bad. But you have to put yourself in the time frame of when things are happening. And I think too often we get caught in the thing of oh, everything's bad, so let's tear it all down. And we can't do that because it is part of our history, and we have to admit that parts of our history are not great. All right, but I'll just leave it at that. We can talk more again about Witherspoon, but this probably is not the time and place. Well, and, and I'll say we don't know and haven't seen a lot of clear evidence of where slavery, slavery was a part of this church. Um, there's a great new book out by Dr. Long. I don't know if you've seen that. The Presbyterian Church and the History of Slavery. Pardon me? No. This is Dr. Wong. Wong. Yeah, W-O-N-G. Uh, it was published last year. It's the Presbyterian Church and Slavery and the history of it. It's a great book, but it opens tons of questions for us to be curious about. We know better, so we do better now, but it is important that we know and acknowledge where and how that has been a part of our history. And it's my hope that in our 301st year, we'll explore more of that. So I think, yes, Or did you say that this particular building had balconies on the side? Not this building. The, the second building in the cemetery, when it was built, it was a wood frame building, and it had three balconies. And I, if you ever go to Cranberry Presbyterian Church and go in there, it probably was much like that, that current church. And NASA has the same kind of balcony as well. What we don't know, and George and I have spent some time talking about, but have not had a time to really dig into the history and, and explore this more, is if the church is moved here in 1852, and the balconies are not put into this space, but there was a space for people of color in the last sanctuary, where would the people of color worship in this space? There's only a floor, so we assume that it would be within. Although at the same time, the Presbyterian Church of Witherspoon, what we know as Witherspoon Street, starts. And so the question is, do the do people of color stop worshiping in predominantly white congregations, and do they start and go to Witherspoon? Stuff to explore. Don't see any other hands. But as, as you, did someone have a hand? No, I was oh. going to say Robert. I am glad to invite Robert to the next portion. But thanks for good questions. Right now, um, we have some presentations. We have some presentations. One of the things uh, a municipality it is parts of several municipalities, and uh, one of the things that the Presbyterian Church has done is give a sense of community to the whole community. To this divided community that's in many, uh, sorry, in many different uh, municipalities. Uh, there's a part that's in Princeton, there's a part that's in South Brunswick, Franklin, even a little bit in Plainsboro, actually. Uh, but uh, we're really honored that Princeton, South Brunswick, and Franklin all have come and have resolutions to give. Uh, and I would like, for, first of all, to ask Senator Zwicker, Andrew Zwicker, who has the resolution.
Good evening, everybody. What a pleasure to be here. I guess I'm wearing two hats today. Uh, one as a member, as I found out tonight, as the second Kingston resident who is also, I, I thought I was the first, so now I need to know more about Senator Charles B. Moore. And of course, as a, a resident of our village, when we were downstairs just chatting in, in fellowship, several people said to me they'd never seen me in anything but my running clothes. <laughs> I know there's several people here who go, I know that guy, he's the one who runs by, he seems like almost every morning. And as Robert, as you pointed out, if I start on Spruce, go over to Shaw, come around into the cemetery, go down to Academy, over to Euclid, and eventually make it back to Spruce, I've hit two townships, two counties, <laughs> but only one village. Uh, Pastor Dixon, congratulations on, on 10 years, which is really such a wonderful... I feel like we just got here. Well, clearly in 300 years, uh, you've got to it out. I've been a resident of Kingston for 20 years. Uh, my wife, Barbara, who's here with me, she authorized me to say, and I'm going to be very precise in my language, she's been a resident of the village of Kingston for more than 50 years. But I can't be more precise than that. <laughs> And of course, with George behind me and, and many others, you've been a resident of the village of Kingston for generations. And this is about community. And what a wonderful, wonderful thing to come here and celebrate 300 years. I will tell you a kind of story of the steeple. I had forgotten the day that it was going to be raised again. And I was sitting in my backyard across the street and happened to look up, and I'm like, I did not understand what I was seeing. It was <laughs> people. <laughs> in the way, exactly. And you could watch it slowly and majestically and beautifully uh, uh, coming down. Uh, I also learned that the, 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 the various ways that one can be buried in the, in the cemetery, including my father-in-law, who was a, a many decade resident. Of, of the village is now buried over in the cemetery. So, um, last thing before I get to my resolution, uh, you know, my wife was, was born here and raised here, but I was not. And we were looking for where do we want to raise our own children. And when Barbara's parents decided it was time to retire and, and move to New York, what better place than to raise our kids in the house that that she was raised in because of the because of the community that is here, because of this church, because of each of you. So with that, I'll put my other hat on uh, as the second state senator and say that I have come with a resolution. I know my, my colleagues from the various townships have resolutions for for the towns. I brought one for the state of New Jersey. This is a Senate resolution on this with the state of New Jersey. I will say, you know, some of our records, as you said, have been lost because of fire and other, other things. But uh, this is now entered into the record of the, of the state of New Jersey forevermore. So uh, this is a Senate resolution by uh, myself to the Kingston Presbyterian Church on the 300th anniversary. Whereas the Senate of the state of New Jersey is pleased to salute Kingston Presbyterian Church upon this felicitous occasion, which bears witness to the immeasurable contributions this historic congregation has made in Middlesex, Somerset, and Mercer counties, as we learned, throughout the past three centuries. Whereas established in a modest law structure in 1723, the Kingston Presbyterian Church has grown from its humble beginnings as one of the early torchbearers of the colonial Presbyterian movement into a thriving community known for its rich tradition of fellowship and mission supported home and abroad. And whereas since its founding, the church has been ably and effectively shepherded by a number of inspiring and devoted leaders whose legacy continues to guide the church in its benevolent ministries, including its Sunday school, its grief share group, collections for local food banks, and other outstanding initiatives that have significantly improved the quality of life of the people of Kings and beyond. And whereas throughout many seasons of change and growth, as we heard tonight, 
Kingston Presbyterian Church is attending to the spiritual, social, and emotional needs of its members and has helped them become caring and compassionate citizens. Where it is altogether fitting and proper for this House, the Senate, to pause in its deliberations to acknowledge Kingston Presbyterian Church and praise all of those that contrib contribute to its success and vigor. And now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate of the State of New Jersey, this House hereby congratulates Kingston Presbyterian Church upon its 300th anniversary, pays tribute to its dedicated members, and extends its most sincere gratitude for their many years of faithful and fruitful service to their fellow New Jerseyans, and be it further resolved that a duly authenticated copy of this resolution signed by the President of the Senate and attested by the Secretary be transmitted tonight to the Kingston Presbyterian Church. Sincerely, Nicholas P. Scutari, President of the Senate. And this is for you. Congratulations. Happy to be here today, but I brought along the mayor of Franklin Township, Mayor Phil Kramer. Um, and I was joking with him earlier. I said, um, You know, at 13, did you write a book? And what have you actually accomplished? So we want to congratulate Marcus as well for his amazing research. Um, congratulations on the board. Of the we should know the mayor is also very accomplished in addition to being an engineer and a B-52 pilot, and a neuro, uh, uh, I'll get that wrong, I always say neurosurgeon, but something with nerves and a doctor, um, uh, and mayor of our town. He's a, a wonderful person, um, and I'm gonna ask him to share some words before I uh, present the, the formal resolution. I'll be very quick, I'm glad uh, Ed talked me into coming here. I love the history, uh, it's amazing. Um, from uh, log cabin to this, 300 years of spirit, spirituality, leadership, and guidance. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. And we're so fortunate to be the leader here now. It is my pleasure. Thank you. And um, so, whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church received its charter 300 years ago, if you haven't heard. <laughs> Whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church, the first institution established in Kingston, uh, played a significant role in the life and history of the village of Kingston and the church's beginning, it is still doing so right now, today. And the church and its members played uh, a great role in the history. Uh, its historic 1852 church, where we are today, and, and much earlier cemetery, both of which were contributing to the resources. Um, and the fact that it's part of the Kingston Village National Historic Registry. Um, I'm gonna skip the part where it's 300 years as an anniversary. Um, the, 
Franklin Township Mayor Phil Kramer and myself, Council Member Ed Potasnik, want to thank the church for all that it does for members of the community, the many contributions that it makes, and express our heartfelt appreciation for the valuable service that you play. One thing that's not in here, but three days from now, the church will open up its doors for voting. It is primary day, and elections are really important. And this guy's on the ballot, and I think that guy's on the ballot. <laughs> anyway, I just figured I'm, I'm not on the ballot. So, um, now, therefore, uh, we, Phil Kramer, Mayor, and Ed Kapazin, Councilmember Franklin Township of Somerset County, the state of New Jersey, on behalf of the Township Council, do hereby offer its sincerest gratitude to the Kingston Presbyterian Church for its contributions for these members of the Kingston community and beyond, as we heard internationally, and wish the church and its members the very best and bright future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we have Councilman Joe Camarada from South Brunswick. And South Brunswick and Franklin really share uh, the village itself. Although Kingston is more than the village, it includes a bit of Princeton as well. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we welcome you. Robert, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Reverend Dixon. Again, congratulations. Um, you're doing a great job for having night here. So, uh, and all the people coming out today, I'm sure a lot of due to your uh, extraordinary efforts. So, thank you. Always, always, this man knows so much. I mean, he's so intriguing. He knows so much. I'm not talking about uh, uh, George Locke. What a, what, a, what a person to represent this community. I mean, I think. I know you have like five jobs, but <laughs> <laughs> and I know this is uh, something of benevolence for you, something that you really care, and uh, it, it shows, it really does show it's how much you care about this community, uh, this church, and it, it's contagious, and again, that's part of the reason so many people are here, so I, I thank you for your dedication and commitment to this church, this community, and this township, and these three different counties, different <laughs> towns, and uh, you represent them all very well. And I am here tonight, it's an honor to be here tonight representing South Brunswick, uh, myself, uh, along with Mayor Carley and the count other council members. Uh, so I am now get to the duty at hand and recognition, I think it's 299 years? No, 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 no. You're, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Okay, whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church is celebrating its 300th anniversary, whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church maintains its historic 1852 church in 1852, and its much earlier cemetery, both of which are contributing sewer sources to the Kingston Village National Register Historic District, and whereas the members of the Kingston Presbyterian Church, the first institution established in Kingston, that, that's, that's pretty heroic, and and when you talk about 300 years, I, I would venture to guess there's not too many churches that are older than this church in the country. To continue, as played a significant role in the life and history of the village of Kingston from the church's beginning and can continue to do so today. And whereas the South Brunswick Township and the Kingston Historical Society wishes to thank the Kingston Presbyterian Church and its members for the many contributions and express heartfelt appreciation for their valuable service. Now, therefore, be resolved on this, the ninth day of May, 2023, by the mayor, myself, Deputy Mayor, and Township Council of South Brunswick, County of Middlesex, State of New Jersey, that the mayor and Township Council and the Kingston Historical Society of Kingston, New Jersey, recognize and graduate Kingston Presbyterian Church on their 300th year anniversary 
and offer sincere gratitude for the contributions and to the community and wishes the church and the members the very best in the future. A copy of this resolution will be spread upon the official minutes of the Township of South Brunswick in recognition of this achievement and copies will be forwarded to the Kingston Presbyterian Church, the Kingston Historical Society of Kingston, New Jersey. It's a true honor to do this. Uh, community is, is church. Church is community. And you've done it both well. Uh, you're, you're carrying a torch, uh, maybe for another 300 years. So God bless. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Extended to the area of Snowden Lane in person, whereas the original church building in the cemetery burned down in 1791, and another was erected in 1792 on the same foundation. The congregation worshipped in that frame structure until 1852, when the present building on Main Street in Kingston was constructed. And whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church members played a significant role in the life and the history of the village of Kingston, from the church's beginning and continues to do so today. And whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church maintains its historic 1852 church and its much earlier cemetery, both of which are contributing resources to the Kingston Village National Register Historic District. And whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church sponsors missionaries in many foreign countries, including India, China, Haiti, France, and other countries, and whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church hosted a Japanese church for 10 years and has hosted the Princeton Korean Church for the past 17 years, and whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church is celebrating its 300th anniversary, now therefore be resolved, I, Mark Frieda Mayer, and the Council of Princeton, County of Mercer, State of New Jersey, do offer our most sincere appreciation and congratulations to the Kingston Presbyterian Church of Kingston, New Jersey, for its contributions and those of its members to the village of Kingston and surrounding communities on their 300th anniversary. Thank you. taught me a lot. <laughs> I think last year about it, Thursday. Yeah. 
gangster activity, there's um, mob activity, bootleggers, and nights and weekends you just find something new and have to go into his book. And um, you know, it's a, I would say it's a miracle that we're here and the church is here with all of this at the moment. But, you know, it's more that it's a testament to the people and the community and the church that built Kingston and they sacrificed so much for us here to be here today. So, with that, as uh, chair of the Franklin Township Fire District 4, I'm going to let my better set of eyes read the resolution. Franklin Township Fire District 4 of Kingston, New Jersey, presents the, this revolution, resolution, whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church received its charter 300 years ago and is celebrating its tricentennial anniversary, whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church, the first institution established in Kingston, has played a significant role in the life and history of the village of Kingston from the church's beginning and continues to do so today. Whereas the Kingston Presbyterian Church members played a significant role in the life and the history of the village of Kingston from the church's beginning to the continue to do so today. Whereas the Franklin Township Fire District 4 wishes to thank the Kingston Presbyterian Church and its members for their many contributions to the fire company and its members and expresses heartfelt appreciation for their valuable service. Now therefore be it resolved that on its 300th anniversary, the commissioners of Franklin Township Fire District 4 of Kingston, New Jersey offers its sincerest gratitude to the Kingston Presbyterian Church of Kingston, New Jersey for its contributions and those of its members to the Kingston community and wishes the church and its members the very best in the future. This first day of June 2023, the Franklin Township Fire District for Commission. Presbyterian Church for some time now and we're really grateful for their work and we although we are a mixed group we, we, by no means of all our members belong to the church uh, but we're grateful particularly for our vice president George Locke who, who was here um, we have a very simple uh, plaque that we'd like to present to the church uh, the Kingston Presbyterian Church in recognition of its service to support for and partnership with the Kingston community for 300 years, 1723 to 2013. Present in this day. And we really appreciate all that you've done. It's really a remarkable achievement.
like to thank the Haitian Historical Society for this great evening. I know we all have all learned a lot and enjoyed hearing about the history. So please join me in giving them a wonderful evening. representatives of our governing bodies uh, in this tri-county area <laughs> for, and especially for my mayor, <laughs> the mayor of Princeton, for coming tonight and presenting us with these uh, momentous uh, words and all of these wonderful resolutions. It's much appreciated and on behalf of Kingston Presbyterian Church, I thank you. One of the great pleasures of being the pastor of this church is that on Sunday mornings, I get to give the benediction, which is just a big fancy word for a blessing. And who doesn't want a blessing? Right? And I know that I have been blessed tonight. I hope that you have been blessed. We've heard how the church has been a blessing. I know how you are a blessing. So friends, neighbors, go in peace. Go in kindness. Go in friendship. Go and be a blessing. Be who you are.